Uh, good evening, everyone. To the, this is the 14th Birkenhead Lecture. Uh, the Birkenhead Lecture is always given by one of the most distinguished lawyers, and today is no exception. Um, professor Louise Gulliver is the Rouse Paul Professor of English Law at Cambridge and a fellow of Gonville and Keyes. Uh, she teaches and writes extensively in all areas of commercial and financial law. She's currently co-director of a project on digital assets and is writing and editing a series of books on secured transactions, law and reform around the world, of which the volume on Africa will be published. It's got down here in 2019, but that can't be right. <laughs> this, has been published. this has been published. And another one she, after that. Good. So she's acted as, as an expert uh, witness in cases concerning set-off, intermediated securities and insolvency law. She was the founding director of the Commercial Law Centre at Harris Manchester College and executive director of the Secure Transaction Law Reform Project, as well as the Oxford Academic Lead of the Cambridge Town Convention Academic Project. She's co-chair of the Academic Committee of the International Insolvency Institute and a member of the International Academy of Commercial and Consumer Law. Uh, she's an associate member of the 3VB, where she practiced for a number of years and is a bencher of Gray's Inn. The, the subject this evening, uh, private law of digital assets, is, is one of huge importance. It's rapidly moving, there's huge uncertainty, uh, and I'm sure all that uncertainty will be resolved this evening. <laughs> Over to you. Thank you very much. So first of all, I'd like to thank the Treasurer for inviting me to give to this lecture, and thank everyone involved in setting it up, especially the Under-Treasurer and Tony Charles. And of course, I'd like to thank you all for coming. It's lovely to see, see you all and lovely to see quite a few people who I know, either former students or friends. Uh, my connection with Gray's Inn goes back a long way. I think I first joined in 1982 or thereabouts, which probably seems a very long time to many, ago to many of you. And it was when I was a student at Oxford and I was called to the bar and then practiced as a member, as Ali said, of 3VB, which was then 3 Grays in place, until my daughter was born in 1991, after which I stopped practice and became an academic. But I'm internally grateful to the Inn for supporting me with scholarships during my bar exam year, for the education and camaraderie that came from moots, dinners, social events, chapel services, and all the other facets of in life. So it's lovely to be able to come and give this lecture. Now I'm going to try and see if this works. Yes, brilliant. Okay, so my subject today is the private law of digital assets. Now I'll talk in more detail in a minute as to what kind of digital assets I'm talking about, but just to get started, let us say that these are assets which are held on an electronic system designed to enable them to be transferred without any human or institutional intervention. So examples you'll have heard of, Bitcoin, tokenized securities. And these are held on systems using blockchain and distributed ledger technology. Now I'm not going to refer much to the technology, but only the actual consequences of the use of the technology. Now, this is partly because I'll probably get the details wrong and partly because we need private law to be technologically neutral and focus more on the actual consequences of the technology. The existence and use of these types of assets has increased exponentially over the last few years. I noticed in the FT yesterday that, they, uh, that in a couple of articles it said that the market for crypto assets was now worth three trillion dollars or pounds, can't remember which, but it's a lot of money. Now, whether we like it or not, they're a phenomenon that requires attention, not only by regulators, but by those who work with and shape private law. But I should first set out a few boundaries for the subject matter of the lecture. It is just about private law and not about regulation, although I will mention regulation once or twice. By private law, I mean the law relating to rights and obligations between natural and legal persons, including contract law, tort law, and property law and by extension, insolvency law. What I want to do today is to explore how the existing law applies to digital assets and where we might need new law, which could be judge-made or could be by legislation. I'm going to talk largely about English law, but it is informed by my work with UNIDOIR in trying to develop more general global principles. Now, just in case you're not familiar with UNIDOIR, it is an intergovernmental organization based in Rome, which produces instruments focusing on the harmonization and unification of private law. 
The Law Commission of England and Wales is working on the English law of digital assets, including trade documents and crypto assets. And I benefited greatly from discussions with the team at the Law Commission. Quite a lot of what I will say came, comes from the submission that I made together with Professor David Fox of Edinburgh University, and we made this to the Law Commission call for evidence earlier in the year. The ideas in this talk have emerged and been refined, a result of my conversations with Professor Fox, to whom I owe an enormous debt of gratitude for his clear thinking discussion, and also with others, including, the, including those involved in the Digital Assets Project that Professor Jenny Payne and I have run at Oxford for several years. And I should mention in particular Hin Liu, who's my former graduate student, and, and he and I have already written one paper together. And as I mentioned, the more general ideas in the talk are informed by the discussions of the UNIDWA Working Group, where we're trying to develop global principles for the private law of digital assets, which are not just technologically neutral, but also legal culture neutral. That's no easy task, I can tell you. So, now acknowledgement's over, let's turn to substance. I hope you can see this. I want to focus on a number of challenges for private law that digital assets pre present. First, how do we define a digital asset? And by this, I mean the type of digital asset that can be, and has been held by English courts to be, property. So I put property on this slide with a question mark, but in fact, at least for those falling within the dis uh, definition I'm going to discuss, it is reasonably clear that it is property with English law, within English law. At least I'm, I'm going to assume it is for the purposes of today. As it is property, other issues arise. How is legal title transferred? How do you take security over it? How can one hold it? And lastly, where a digital asset is linked to another asset, increasingly common, what is the link and how effective is it to enable a transfer of the digital asset to transfer title to the linked asset? Now, the key concept to enable us to start to answer these questions is control. In the UNIDRA working group, we've developed the factual, a factual concept of control. It focuses on what can actually be done rather than the legal right to do it or to prevent it being done. And there are three elements. First, the system on which this data is recorded can only be changed by a person who has specific means of doing so. Second, if a person has that specific means, it can prevent anyone else changing the system without using those specific means. Now, the language that is often used for those specific means is that of a key. See the key up there? Um, and it does act something like a key. So if I have a house to which there is only one key, I control access to the house. Only I can open the door, and I can stop anyone else opening the door unless I choose to give them my key or a copy of my key. Now, the analogy is not exact because the key to the digital asset enables the holder to change the record on the system, that is, to transfer the digital asset, rather than to get access to it or to do anything else, for example, to use what's contained in it, which might be the case with the house or a locked box. However, the general idea of a key enabling the holder to do something is similar. Now, many of you will probably know how the public key, private key cryptography system works. Basically, it is that the digital asset is associated with a public key, which is public so that anyone can see it, but which only works to change the system if combined with a private key. So only a person with a private key can change the record. The change in the record that can be made is that the digital asset is then associated with another public key, which requires a different private key to change the record. If I use my private key to change the record so that the digital asset is then associated with the public key, which requires your private key to change the record, in other words, your, private, your public key, then I have transferred control of the digital asset to you. Now, the system also has the effect that I no longer have any control of the digital asset. If I've done that, I no longer have control. So I can't transfer the same asset again. There can be no double spend. To use the analogy of physical money, if I have a one pound coin and I give it to you, 
then I can no longer give it to anyone else. One of the most important features of the blockchain DLT system is that the system is designed to prevent this kind of double spending. It is thus often said that a digital asset held in this way is rivalrous. In other words, only one person can have it at any one time. Now, this factual concept of, contr of, of control is what I'm going to mean when I use the word control in the rest of the talk. Now, the concept of control has a direct impact on most of the questions I raised. First, we can define a digital asset as a controllable electronic record. It is that controllability, plus some other features, that mean it can be classified as property. I'm going to argue in a minute that to transfer legal title, there must be a change of control. One of the key issues in relation to security is whether a security interest over a digital asset should be registrable in a situation where the secured creditor has control. And we can think of custody of digital assets as where, broadly speaking, the custodian has control and the client does not, but has ownership. So control feeds into all of those except the link to other assets, where I'm afraid the concept of control can't really explain this. That remains a mystery, but one I'm going to try and explore a little later on. So we can say then that a digital asset is electronic data or electronic information or an electronic record, that's three ways of saying roughly the same thing, that can be controlled. However, in relation to some types of digital assets, there is a paradox. The asset is not the data, the information, or the record. That isn't what the owner of the digital asset actually wants. It is, in fact, pretty useless. Depending on the system, the data is a UTXO, an unspent transaction output, as in Bitcoin, or a record of an account, as in Ethereum. Now, these work slightly differently, but the basic idea is the same. They are a record of transactions which, when interpreted by software, let you know how much you have to spend. But that record would be no use to you at all unless you had the ability to spend the balance. The only reason the record has value is because you, as the holder of the private key, can change the record so that some of that unspent balance can be transferred to someone else i.e. it can become associated with that person's public key. The thing of value is the ability to change the system and not the data itself. Now some digital assets, we can call them exogenous assets, are linked to real, real world assets, ones that exist outside the system. And here the value seems obvious. Let us assume that a digital asset is linked to a piece of gold. The gold is valuable. So, the digital asset is valuable, at least to the extent that owning the digital asset means that you own the gold. I'll take later, tell, talk later on about how and whether that can be achieved. Having the ability to change the record, if it works, means you can sell the gold. But what about a digital asset that is not linked to anything, an endogenous asset like Bitcoin? The only value is in the ability to change the record. You can sell that ability, but why would anyone pay for it? The answer to that is that somebody else will pay them for it, and, and so on. So what is a digital asset? Well, I think Professor David Fox has it right when he conceptualizes it as a transactional power, the power to make transactions according to the rules of the system. This is actually quite hard to get your head around because we usually think of a power as something we have in relation to a thing. I have the power to grant you good title to my bicycle or against a particular person. Here, is there, here there is no thing and the power is in relation to the system and not against one or more persons. So we use a metaphor. We call this power a digital asset. Sometimes we call it a token. And we talk about it as though it is a thing that can be controlled and transferred. And to make it easier to understand what I'm talking about, I'm going to do that as well for the rest of the talk. So are endogenous digital assets, those that are not linked to any real world assets, are they property? Now this is quite well trodden ground, and you can read a lot of the argument for yourself. 
So I'm going to give you some pointers to the discussion and where we are in English law and then move on to other things. Now, first of all, why does it matter? If a digital asset is property, then it can be subject to proprietary rights, such as ownership or a security right. And some of the conclusions flowing from this are on the slide. The owner can follow the assets in the event of an unauthorized disposition or perhaps trace its value. Various procedural remedies are available for someone making a proprietary claim. It can be used to secure an obligation and it forms part of the assets available to distribution on the insolvency of its owner. Extremely important. I think it's now relatively well settled in the common law that an endogenous digital asset is property. Although, of course, not a binding authority, the UK Jurisdictional Task Force in its legal statement of November 2019, concluded that it was property. This conclusion was followed by Mr. Justice Bryan after considerable discussion of the issue in a case called AA and Persons Unknown in January 2020, which in fact was an application for a proprietary injunction. After a very fully argued hearing, the same conclusion was reached in New Zealand in the case of Rusco and Cryptopia Limited in April 2020. A number of UK cases concerning digital assets have since proceeded on the basis that AA was correctly decided and that endogenous digital assets are a form of property under English law, including the Fetch AI and the Litecoin cases I've mentioned there. So it's obviously still property to argue, at least in the higher courts, that digital assets are not property in English law. And it's not entirely clear, of course, whether they are shows in action or other intangible property. That's a debate that's still raging. But an argument that they're not property is, I think, quite unlikely to succeed, especially given a growing international consensus that they can be the subject of proprietary rights. And there are a number of features of digital assets which make it appropriate for them to be cast, classed as property. Versions of these features appear in cases and scholarly discourse on the nature of property, and they are relied upon by the UK task force. Digital assets can be individuated. So each one is individual and can be identified. This is how the system works. The system records transactions, and so each digital asset will have a unique transaction history and is therefore distinct from any other. Now, we need to remember this is a different point from whether digital assets can be seen as fungible, that is, interchangeable. That is a matter for the relevant parties and maybe for the relevant market. So on any market or between parties, if transfer of any digital asset of a particular type, such as Bitcoin, can be used to comply with an agreement or an obligation to transfer, then the digital asset is fungible. And most digital assets are seen as fungible except, for example, non-fungible tokens. The clue might be in the name. Now, going back to the features of property, digital assets can be controlled, said that already, and they are rivalness, and I've said that already. They can be transferred, and they have a degree of permanence. There's no requirement that property has to be completely permanent, most of it is not, but it has to have a degree of permanence. So since all these are features of digital assets, it seems appropriate that they are property. So now I'm going to turn to how legal ownership in digital assets is transferred under English law. And this is setting out an argument that I, together with my student Hin Liu, have made elsewhere. Now I make it slightly tentatively, but I do actually think that this is what English law should be. And if this is right, then it would be possible for the courts to go down this route and to establish this, but, um, and for the rule to be judge made. But it might be that in the interests of certainty, it would be better to be confirmed by legislation, particularly if the rule at the bottom of the slide, a taking free rule, which I'll mention in a minute, were thought to be desirable as you need legislation to um, uh, make, make that a rule. Now, the argument I'm making is that change of control is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for transfer of legal ownership under English law. It isn't sufficient because there needs to be as well an intention to transfer and the person transferring must also have the right to transfer. 
either because they're the owner or because they are authorized by the owner. A transfer by any means other than change of control, I would suggest, takes effect in equity but doesn't transfer legal title. Why do I say that change of control is a necessary condition? Well, we have to think about how a transfer could be conceptualized. Digital assets cannot be transferred by assignment or novation, as they're not actually rights against any particular person. Although the digital asset is clearly an intangible, the nearest analogy when thinking about a transfer, though it's not a complete analogy by any means, is the transfer of legal title to goods. It's much more like that than transfer of a right against a party. Now, transfer of legal title to goods, I'm sure you know, is effected in English law by three methods. A deed or bill of sale, by delivery, or by sale. Now, transfer by a lead or deed or bill of sale is clearly unsuitable for digital assets, because the whole point is that the transfer can be immediate and electronic. In a sale, property, so legal title, passes when the parties intend it to pass. It doesn't have to be delivery. Parties can agree that property passes at different times. This rule is unsuitable for digital assets, since if legal title could be transferred whenever the part is intended, as, a, as opposed to a change of control on the system, the record constituted by the system would quickly become desynchronized from the record, um, uh, uh, record of the system and ownership will be completely hidden. Now, of course, if the parties want hidden ownership, this can be affected. They can do it by a transfer in equity, in other words, off the system. So I would suggest it's much more appropriate for a transfer of legal title to digital assets to only take place where there is the equivalent of, equivalence of delivery. Delivery of goods is a transfer of possession, but you can't have a transfer of possession of an intangible digital asset. So there would need to be a transfer of control instead. This has the benefit that, prima facie, the record on the system will be synchronized with the location of legal title. However, it is only prima facie. As I said, the transfer law would need to have the right to transfer, and they might not have this. Now, this raises a separate question, which I'm not going to go into because it's quite complicated, and that is whether there should be a rule that a good faith acquirer takes free even of a prior legal interest as, for example, was established in relation to money in the case of Miller and Race. The Unidra Working Group have decided that their principles will suggest that there should be such a rule because of the need for security of transactions. But in terms of English law, this is very much an open question. So I'm now going to turn to security, um, looking at the four categories of security interest under English law. It's reasonably clear that, since possession can only be taken over tangibles under English law, digital assets can't be the subject of a pledge or a lien. However, they could be the subject of a mortgage or a charge, which is non-possessory. So the main question, it seems to me, is whether, at least when considering mortgages or charges created by companies, a mortgage or charge over a digital asset needs to be registered under the Companies Act in the situation where the secured creditor has control of the digital asset. Otherwise, clearly, it would have to be registered. Now, there are two possible policy arguments in favor of the registration requirements being disapplied where the, when the secured creditor has control. The first is that control by the secured creditor, which would normally create a legal mortgage by transfer of legal title, if this were intended, gives sufficient publicity of the security interest. After all, having transferred control, the mortgagor can no longer transfer control of the asset to anyone else. He can't sell it, he can't give a legal mortgage over it. And this inability would show a potential secured creditor that there is likely to be a security interest over the asset or that the debtor does not own the asset. However, the mortgagor could control could create a charge over the asset because that would not require a change of control. And without registration, there's no easy way for the potential chargee to find out the true position. So even if that argument doesn't convince, there is another argument, which is that there are market-based reasons for exempting a security interest, 
involving a change of control from registration. Such, in, regis, uh, such interest could be short term in a rapidly changing market and registration could be said to be too cumbersome. That's a similar argument to that advanced for securities traded on the capital markets. Moreover, in a market where transactions are affected by smart contracts, registration, which involves some form of human action, could be seen as inappropriate. If this argument convinces, there is still the question as to how to achieve the desired result. Should there be specific legislation, or is the answer to extend the financial collateral arrangements number two regulations to cover digital assets? Um, that are those, for those who are not familiar, are the regulations applying to transactions largely on the capital markets involving securities where registration uh, is sometimes disapplied. Now these regulations might require careful thought because there are other consequences if a security interest falls within the regulations, such as the disapplication of various parts of insolvency law. Now of course it could just be said that Rather than use control-based security interests, parties will just use title transfer collateral arrangements, which need not be registered anyway. And that's quite likely um, to happen in the market um, and probably already is happening. The problem with those arrangements is that the collateral provider is at risk of the counterparty's insolvency to, extent, to the extent of any surplus value in the collateral. And that could be a danger in a market where values change quickly. And that might well be the subject of, of regulation. So now I'm going to turn to how digital assets are held. Now, given the time, I'm only going to explain this in outline. Although I'm co-chair of the subgroup on custody for the UNIDRA project, so I've spent quite a lot of time thinking about the principles relating to this area. The first challenge is to, find, to define what we mean by custody as opposed to other ways of holding a digital asset. So if A owns a digital asset, there are at least three possibilities. The first is that A controls the digital asset herself, either because she acts as a node or because she controls it through a wallet. Now I've called this a non-custodial wallet on the slide, although as I've discovered from talking to many people that what the parties call the wallet may not be definitive, and in any particular case, even a non-custodial wallet might in fact give rise to what I call custody. Now, in this situation, A continues to own the asset. The second possibility is that A can transfer control to a person who holds the asset on A's behalf, and A no longer has control of the asset, and that's what I'd call custody. The relationship could arise in a number of situations including where A transfers an asset to an exchange who is then instructed to sell it on A's behalf and the situation where an exchange acquires a digital asset on A's behalf, as well as where the parties actually call the relationship custody. A will continue to have a proprietary interest in the asset and I would suggest that the English law analysis here is the custodian who, may, who has control, will have legal title, but will hold the asset on trust for A. The third possibility is where A transfers control and ownership of the digital asset to another person, B, who then owes A a merely contractual obligation to transfer back an equivalent digital asset. An example of, of this, or where this would be the case, is where B lends out the digital assets it owns and earns interest, some of which is passed on to the clients. And there's a real world example, I'm sure there's plenty, but a platform called Celsius. The analogy with a bank deposit is clear and the legal analysis, I would suggest, is the same. What A has is a right against B. B, not A, owns the asset. And in fact, if it's an exchange, B may well dispose of the asset and have no proprietary rights in relation to it at all. In this situation, A bears the insolvency risk of B. Now, custody and maybe some of these other situations are clearly areas where regulatory, regulatory provisions are required, at least to protect vulnerable customers from risks they don't appreciate, and probably also to bring custodians, hopefully widely defined as I have just done, to include exchanges within the regulatory net. 
However, apart from providing an analytical structure, what can private law say about custody? I think it can say two things. First, to ensure that clients of custodians, that's the second category on the previous slide, um, to ensure that their clients have proprietary protection against the insolvency of the custodian, probably by the use of the trust, so that the custodian holds the asset on trust for the client. If the trust is used, we need to consider we need, whether we need anything more than general trust law to ensure that there are some non-excludable duties imposed on custodians, such as a duty of care in relation to safeguarding, a duty to comply with the client's instructions, limits on the right of use, that is the right of the custodian to dispose of the assets in part or in whole for its own benefits, and segregation, segregation from the custodian's own assets and a duty to maintain accurate records. Now I turn to what I think is one of the most interesting areas of the private law in relation to digital assets, but one which I think is clearly governed by national law and which will vary considerably from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And this is where a digital asset purports to be linked to a real-world asset. Now, after many discussions in the UNIDRAR working group, we think it's best to see the digital asset as a separate thing to the other real-world asset, but linked in some way to that asset. So that the whole of the digital asset has two things, the digital asset and the linked asset. And I should say that this is one reason uh, why it's because we see the link as a matter of national law, the principles are unlikely to say very much more about the link. But what I'm talking about now is how it might work in English law. Now, the benefit of the view of seeing them as two different things is that the same rules can then apply to endogenous assets where there's no link and in exogenous assets where there is a link. So, for example, the same concept of control can apply to both and we can realistically think of the digital asset being the thing which is the subject of custody, even though if the link is close enough and the real world asset is intangible, it might make sense to say that the real world asset is also the subject of custody. Now, what real world assets are we talking about here? Well, here are some ideas. And the intangibles include the obvious equity and debt securities, and there are actually some actual examples, plenty of actual examples out there. But also other rights, um, usually contractual, against another person. Rights to money, rights to, that's debts, rights to goods, or rights to services. So you might have heard, for example, something called a utility token. I think one could probably analyze that as a token linked to a contractual right to certain services. Now, another possibility is a link to money itself, although that, of course, will normally be in the form of a right against a bank or a right against a central bank. And there could be a link to another digital asset. And another, perhaps even more theoretical possibility, is a link to intellectual property. Now, the list of tangibles is short, because basically there really are only two types of tangibles, land and goods. I put documentary intangibles in brackets because I suppose they're strictly speaking tangibles, but it does seem very unlikely that they would be linked to digital assets. Um, so we're really looking at land and goods. For example, gold, I'll talk about gold in a minute. As I'll explain, it's quite difficult to have an effective link between a tangible asset and a digital asset. And so certainly in relation, of, in relation to say land, the easiest way to do it is for a special purpose company to buy the asset, to buy the land, and then the shares in that SPV to be linked to the digital asset. And I think that's how most of them are, are structured. So we're not talking about tangibles at all. We're just talking about shares at the top of the intangible list. Now, these um, are, the, are my six suggestions for the possible way in which the link can occur. But I'm not going to go through this slide. It's just an overview of what I'm going to talk about. And you can at least see that the end is in sight. Um, so I will turn to the first category which is where statute provides specifically for the link. And the first and simplest way the link between the digital asset and the real world asset can occur is if statute provides for that link. So there are a couple of possibilities based on registration. One is that the system on which an asset is held, so the system is set up and then it is legislatively designated as a register of ownership. 
And the other way is that statute provides that a register which has previous, previously existed in paper or other electronic form, such as an electronic register controlled by a registrar, can now be constituted by a system recording digital assets. So an example of the first category where you have a, where you have a system which is then legislatively given a, a, a force of law, um, I don't know of, a, of one that's actually happened, but I'll give you a sort of fantasy example if you like. And that would be if a statute were passed to provide that any system recording digital assets which tracked the supply chain of wholesale diamonds was, was conclusive evidence as to the ownership of those diamonds. So the statute would say that the person who controls the digital asset on the system was the owner of the diamond to which it related. Now there is actually a system, a blockchain, DLT blockchain system, which tracks the ownership of diamonds. It's called Tracer, as you can see. Now, I'm not suggesting there could be a statute for Tracer, or for that matter at all, to die for diamonds, since the supply of chain in diamonds is so international that no one country could actually legislate effectively. But I think the tracer idea is quite a good illustration of where a system which exists could then be given legislative force so that registration became legal title. Now an example of the second type of legislation we actually have, and that's one which provides that a share registrar of a company could be held using a system recording digital assets. This happened in 2017 in Delaware in the US uh, where sections 219 and 224 of the Corporations Law of the Delaware Code were amended to allow the stock ledger to be held on a DLT system. So you can, if you can read it, you can see there, section 219 says the stock ledger is a record in accordance with section 224, and section 224 says that the record can be held electronically, including on one or more distributed electronic networks or databases. It's also possible for specific legislation to provide more generally for there to be a legal link between digital assets and other assets. So Liechtenstein's Blockchain Act was passed in 2019, and this provides that a digital asset is what is colloquially called a container, or in the Act, a token. And I should say that what I've got here is a, um, a translation, which I think is, a, it isn't an authorised translation, but it's fairly uh, a good translation, as I understand it. Obviously, the Act itself is in French. The container can be empty, that is, the endogenous legal asset or it can contain a right to property or against a person. So an empty container would be Bitcoin, but the kind of assets I'm talking about now would be a, a filled container. It would contain a right to property or a right against a person. So Article 7 of the Act provides that disposal over the token results in disposal over the right represented by the token. Well, that seems pretty conclusive. That's, that's the, what the legislation says. But there is obviously some doubt as to how effective it could be, because subsection 2 of Article 2 provides that if the legal effect under 1 does not, sorry, subsection 2 of Article 7, sorry, provides that if the legal effect under 1 does not come into force by law, the person obliged, as a result of the disposal over the token, must ensure through suitable measures that A, the disposal over a token directly or indirectly results in the disposal over the represented right, and B, a competing disposal over the represented right is excluded. In other words, if it doesn't work under the statute, the transferor has to do it themselves. Now, I consulted some, a Liechtenstein expert to find out what happened if the person obliged doesn't carry out that obligation. And I'm told that in that situation, the real-world asset is not transferred and the putative transferee only has a contractual claim against the putative transferor. So even with this type of legislation, the system isn't entirely foolproof. Now another analysis is for the digital asset to be treated as a documentary intangible, such as a negotiable instrument or document of title to goods. Now, I'm sure you all know that documentary intangibles are pieces of paper which represent either ownership rights, so that transfer of the document transfers ownership, or possessory rights, so that transfer of the document transfers constructive possession. Thus, the transfer of a negotiable instrument which represents a debt, 
transfers the right to be paid that debt. And transfer of a bill of lading transfers the right, uh, transfers constructive possession to the goods to which it relates. The idea of a documentary tangible, intangible then is a document which is easy to transfer can affect the transfer of something that it is less easy to transfer by locking up the right to that thing in that document. Okay, you might think that idea maps quite well onto the exogenous digital asset situation because here we have something of no real value in itself, like a piece of paper, we've got the digital asset, and the transfer of the digital asset purports to transfer a valuable right. However, there's a bit of a snag. It took hundreds of years for the law on negotiable instruments and documents of title to goods to develop. The law on negotiable instruments was eventually codified in the Bills of Exchange Act, and what counts as a document of title to goods at common law is a matter of mercantile custom. But in the absence of mercantile custom, there needs to be a statute. Well, unless the idea of mercantile custom has speeded up considerably, since bills of lading were considered to be documents of title, which took hundreds of years, it is quite unlikely that at the moment there would held to be a mercantile custom to that effect in relation to digital assets. More importantly, a digital asset is not a document or an instrument because it is not a piece of paper. So, both these points, not surprisingly, were mentioned by the UK task force and they reached the conclusion that di digital assets were not, at the moment, documents of title. Now, it would be possible for statute to provide that certain classes of digital assets, perhaps those that mirror documents which are currently documentary intangibles, to have the same effect as documentary intangibles. And this possibility is being considered, at the moment, by the Law Commission. But even this development isn't trouble-free. First of all, the statute would need to specify to which documents the digital assets would need to be completely analogous. And then in any given case, the digital asset would need to fall within that definition. Now, of course, we could foresee that once we had a statutory definition, those setting up a system for endogenous digital assets would be able to try and bring their digital asset within the system. And I think that's what's envisaged by the Law, Law Commission. But the Law Commission also need to work out, and they're working on this, what is the equivalent to transfer of possession of the piece of paper, of the documentary intangible, when we're talking about digital assets, because the digital asset cannot be possessed. So the most obvious candidate is control, and I would suggest the factual concept of control, as I've mentioned earlier, would be the best concept. So if legislation were passed to that effect, it would mean that when these criteria were met, transfer the digital assets would transfer the right to which it relates. But now we're getting to situations which don't involve a statute. So we're moving away from the relative certainty of being within a legislative provision to where parties try to set up a structure which means that the control of the digital asset is very strong evidence of the ownership of the digital asset. Now, I should say this is a bit general and assumes the person controlling the digital asset owns it, although there are going to be situations such as custody where that isn't the case. But I will concentrate on the basic situation where control and ownership are aligned. As to how to structure a system where control of the digital asset is strong, or perhaps best ownership, evidence of ownership of the, digital asset, of the linked asset, I'm going to outline a few methods which might work, at least as a matter of commercial practice, and mention some things that could go wrong. So first of all, if the real-world asset, can, the linked asset, consists of a personal right, such as the right to be paid, with a correlative obligation on the payer, it is possible to create the obligation to pay in such a way that it can only be discharged by payment to the person who controlled the digital asset. So take an issue of debt securities. So here we are, we've got a bond, and it's possible to issue debt securities saying that the obligation is only discharged if payment is made to a person falling within a specific class or description. So here, that person would be the person or persons who control the relevant digital asset. However, that might not be enough. So, supposing that a person A, so here's A. A controls the digital asset. But instead of transferring the digital asset to a transferee, so transferring the digital asset to, to B, who is a transferee of the digital asset, 
A, assigns the right to receive payment to B by a statutory assignment under Section 136 of the Law of Property Act, so it gives notice to the issuer. But A transfers the right under the uh, bond to B, but doesn't transfer control of a digital asset to B. Now, under a statutory assignment, normally the obligor must pay the assignee and can only get a good discharge from the assignee. So the issuer would say, well, who shall I pay? Well, I suspect the issuer would argue that it can only get a dis good discharge against A according to the term of the debt, and that implies the debt cannot be assigned to someone who didn't control the digital asset. But to be really sure, the bond issue's terms should also contain a clause restricting assignment of the debt to anyone who doesn't control the linked digital asset. So there we have a method that should work for any obligation, providing that the documentation is clear enough and, in theory, would work for any kind of contractual obligation. In other words, not just obligations to pay money. However, it's much more difficult if the real-world asset is something other than an obligation. The most difficult case is a tangible asset. Now, it's often said that digital asset systems can facilitate trading in tangibles because ownership of the tangible, or even an undivided share in the tangible, can be transferred by transfer of the digital asset. But can this really work? So I'm going to take a bar of gold as an example. I'm afraid I could only find a picture of nine bars of, or however many, I don't know, six bars of gold. But anyway, there we are. Get the general drift. So if the digital asset um, was linked to that bar of gold, then control of the digital asset would be evidence of the ownership of the gold. And the ownership would start off synchronously. So here we have A. A owns the gold and A owns the digital asset. If A transfers both the gold and the digital asset to B, if that works, here we go, there you go, um, then this would retain the link between the two. Everything's fine. The problem is, unlike with the contractual right, there is no way to make the gold inherently unable to be transferred to a person except to a digital asset holder. You can't put a non-assignment clause into gold. So there will be nothing to stop B transferring the digital asset to C, there we go, and then selling the gold to D. Um, B would not even need to give D possession of the gold because property and goods can be transferred by, uh, by sale without delivery. Now, of course, A could and will get B to make a contractual promise not to transfer the gold to a person who was not also the transferee of the digital asset. And that might disincentivize B, but it would only give A personal rights against B and wouldn't bind third parties such as D. So the link between the digital asset and the gold can be broken so that the transferee of the digital asset, C, has no proprietary interest in the gold and C would only have a claim against B for breach of contract. Because of this possibility, the digital asset system is not best evidence of ownership and its value in this regard is less than 100%. Now, of course, there are things that can be done to make the lack of synchronization I've described less likely in practice. For example, to take steps to involve, inform potential buyers that the tangible gold was linked to a digital asset. So an example would be if the gold was in the custody of a warehouse and the warehouse was instructed only to make actual or constructive delivery of the tangible gold to a whole current holder of the digital asset. Now, property in the gold could be transferred without delivery, so it would not be impossible as a matter of law for someone to buy the gold without being the transferee of a digital asset. But it's commercially very unlikely. Who on earth would buy the gold if they couldn't get delivery of it? And the more steps like this that are taken, the greater is the strength of the evidence of ownership provided by the holding of the digital asset. But the link becomes even weaker where the transfer of the real world asset requires a formal step such as registration. Examples might be shares, intellectual property, or land. Here, the mere transfer of the digital asset will not transfer legal title to the real world asset, even if that's what the parties want, them to, want to do, um, although it conceivably might be an effective transfer in equity, because the transfer would have to be registered to be a transfer of legal title. 
The problem would, of course, be overcome if the system on which the digital asset was held was, in fact, a statutory register, as I mentioned earlier in relation to Delaware. So in Delaware, you can transfer uh, uh, digital assets which act as transferring the shares. But unless you have that statute, the necessary link is broken where you need registration of the transfer of the real world asset. And that means that the holding of the digital asset is just evidence of intention to transfer the real world asset, which could of course give rise to a personal claim against a transfer or for failure to affect the real world registration. So finally, a very brief word about a very topical linked asset. This is something called the non-fungible token. And this is a token linked to something, usually digital, which can be easily copied and so is difficult to own. So unlike a digital asset, it is non-rivalrous. The token, the digital asset, is created and, as we can see, can be owned and is individuated. So unlike Bitcoin and so on, a non-fungible token is not treated as fungible by the market. It is designed to be unique. So far, so good. So here, A can control and own the NFT. That's fine. The problem is that the token isn't linked to anything that can be owned. So where we're talking about digital art or other digital moments, whatever they call them, there is no unique thing such as a framed canvas for the NFT owner to own. Because the digital thing to which the token is linked is non-rivalness, it isn't property. So the analysis based on evidence of ownership that I've just been talking about won't apply. Now, it is possible that the NFT holder may have something like viewing rights. They can sort of look at their digital art, but then on the whole, everybody else would have that as well. So there might be intellectual property contain, connected with the digital thing, but the way NFTs are set up, there's not even an attempt to link the intellectual property and the digital thing, such as digital art, to the token. Even if that were the case, it would probably be quite difficult to link the transfer of the token to the transfer of the IP, at least under English law, for the reasons mentioned above. But actually, that isn't how NFTs are set up anyway. The IP remains with B, the creator of the art. The holder of the token can't stop anyone from copying or downloading the art. So what does the holder of the NFT get? just a warm feeling that comes from owning an individuated token that purports to be linked to something. And the even more cynical would say that the holder has bragging rights. So, how should we answer the original question I posed? Where do we need new law? Well, many private law aspects of digital assets can be addressed by using existing English law, and particularly the trust and other equitable devices. So I've tried to put on this slide a list of things I think will be new. I am assuming that the classification of endogenous digital assets as property is already established by case law. So a definition of control as a factual concept is key to a lot of the rest of the analysis I've just been talking about. Outside the sphere of digital assets, the word control is a term used in many contexts, and it often donates a legal concept. For example, where X promises Y, he will not dispose of an asset, like in the test for fixed charges as opposed to floating charges, for example. So the fact that the concept of control for digital assets is a factual one, and that that particular concept of control is one that needs to be clearly defined to dovetail with the factual features of these assets, which makes them appropriate to be called property. So although this factual, factual concept could be developed by courts, one might think it's so key that it's likely to need to be established by legislation. Now, if it were thought that change of control were a necessary requirement for transfer of legal title, as I have ans- argued, this too would probably require legislation, as would a taking free rule for good faith acquirers if that were desired. If we wanted a security interest taken by change of control to be exempt from registration, that would certainly require legislation. Could be by extension of the FCARs, that's the Financial Collateral Arrangement Regulations, but as I said, we'd need to think pretty hard whether we'd want the other consequences of the FCARs, such as a disapplication of the insolvency provisions to apply to digital assets. In any event, whatever we decide, we probably will need to amend the FCARs at some point to apply to tokenized securities. 
Now, as I said, we probably need regulation in relation to custody, but I think we also need development of proprietary and contractual protection for clients. It may be, well be that the private law development could take place by case law, because if it's done through trust law, um, that, that kind of development has already happened in relation to the holding of securities through intermediaries. And finally, if we want certainty in relation to exogenous assets, that is, the assets that are linked to real-world assets, legislation is probably desirable here, either to provide for DLT blockchain registers or to provide for digital assets to be documentary intangibles. I'm a bit more skeptical about the Liechtenstein route and whether it would really work for all the categories of linked assets I've discussed, um, partly because even the people in Liechtenstein don't seem to think it's perfect. So, I hope that's given you an overview of at least some of the private law issues rising in relation to digital assets. I'm sure there are many other issues that will arise and many others have already arisen. But the ones I've talked about seem at the moment to be some of the most significant and merit much more detailed and careful attention than I've been able to give them here today. Luckily, as well as those of us who are academics who are thinking about these issues, the Law Commission is thinking very hard about them at the moment and I have every confidence that their consultation paper due in 2022 will contain very thoughtful and measured proposals in this difficult area of the law. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this lecture. I'm not sure there's much time, but I'm very happy to try and answer any questions. Thank you. question here. Yes, hello. It's uh, Dr. Weidmann. I have a question for you. Um, I'm, I'm very new to the digital assets, but uh, uh, when you talk about it, it's, uh, it looks almost as if a digital asset is something like a derivative because the value is derived. If, if, if you have a linked digital asset, mm -hmm. the value is derived from the value of the underlying. Yep. So uh, has there been any thought about uh, the categorization? It's, it's not clearly a derivative, but it's like derivative-like almost. I can see. It depends what you mean by has there been any thought. I think the regulators think about this sort of thing all the time. Yeah. Um, in terms of, of a private law um, analysis, I mean, basically, um, what, when, when somebody issues a digital asset that purports to be linked to exactly. a real-world asset, then they will make various claims about it. And if mm -hmm. they sell them to people and have money, there will be a contract there. Um, and that could be seen as um, giving rise to uh, uh, some kind of derivative contract. The problem that I was looking at was more from the property point of view. In yeah. other words, by transferring the digital asset, if we see that as property, Mm -hmm. And we, we can see it as property. I mean, as I said, certainly endogenous assets are seen as property. Mm -hmm. And what I was suggesting is that the digital asset is effectively the, the same. It's worth, it, what it is worth is a different matter, but it's the same thing, if we can call it a thing, mm -hmm. whether it's endogenous or exogenous. With exogenous, it's just that it has this link mm -hmm. outside. So with an exogenous asset, it is very like though not, as I said, would, this analysis wouldn't work. It's very like a piece of paper, yeah? So you've got a piece of paper which, if it's a documentary intangible, has a lot of value because it's a documentary intangible. And if it's just a piece of paper, it's got very little value. And so the value comes from the strength of the link, yeah? So a value of a, a documentary intangible is very valuable because there is a link, a statutory link or a mercantile custom link or whatever to the right that it represents. Whereas a piece of paper, if I just wrote down on it, you know, um, uh, I, have, I have transferred something to you, then it would just be evidence, which is what I was suggesting. So the digital asset itself, as a, as a matter of a thing, is either like a piece of paper that is just evidence, or it could be like a documentary intangible where it gives a right to the right. And in that way, it's better than a derivative, because a derivative doesn't give you a right to anything, it's just a contract. So you've got the contract to buy the exogenous asset, which is, a, is a, just a contract. And if the exogenous asset isn't properly linked, well, then there's probably a breach of contract there. Um, but what I've really been talking about is not so much about contracts to buy these things, 
of, uh, you know, that's just contract law. I'm talking about the law relating largely to the property rights of the property. thing, actually. Okay, yeah. thanks. Uh. Um, I have a question about the distinction between um, shares and non-fungible tokens. Yes. So, um, on one of your slides, you had two different categories, and you had non-fungible tokens as a kind of asset that didn't interact with the world, whereas shares did have some. Um, I didn't quite, yeah, go on, go on, ask your question. Then ask, yeah. <laughs> whereas there, there was a categorical difference between them in terms of their relationship with the um, external world. Like, um, I, think, I think I'm right in saying that shares have some, on that categorization, had some real world bearing, whereas yeah. NFTs didn't. My question is, um, given that, does that come from um, the fact that you can look at a register in the real world and see who the shareholders are and that that has institutional backing? Or does it come from an evidential basis whereby your ownership of the shares literally gives you things such as potentially a seat at a boardroom or whatever? And if the latter, then does that give rise to any categorical difference in the long run where NFT ownership will essentially allow the same thing? Um, well, so one thing I should say, when I put that slide up, and I don't expect I can find it now, too many clicks, but I, I basically sort of perhaps rather dramatically said, you know, that, that NFTs are basically links to nothing. Because, I mean, if I link it to, you know, a video of a footballer or something like that, of course, the video exists in one sense or the, the, the clip exists but it, because it's non-rivalness it's not property so I'm not linking it to anything that is property or anything that gives rise to any rights and typically I mean I wouldn't say everything every, I mean maybe that there are non-fungible tokens that purport to link to physical assets or which would have the same problem but at least it would be something or purport to leave, link to IP but certainly the typical non-fungible token gives the holder literally nothing because there's nothing for it to link to now a share i mean under english law anyway the companies act tells us that shares are property um there's a you know over the years there have been debates as to what you get when you have a share and what what we mean by a share is property but shares typically give you some rights of some description whether they're voting rights um rights to have dividends if they're declared you know various types of, of rights and and so all i'm saying with shares is that what you have is a, uh, an intangible asset. I mean, a share will exist whether you've got it on a, got a certificate or whether it's registered in Crest or, um, you know, whether the registration is in, um, merely in a, in, a, in a company register. Um, but a share exists irrespective of where it's recorded because you have rights. The record, record is just the root of your title. And what um, I'm suggesting in what, what we, we think is the case in relation to um, tokenized securities is that what you have is the digital asset which is in some way linked to the share and then how the link is, link is constituted is what I've been talking about and I mean it may well be in the future that share registers can be held on DLT and I mean that might be the easiest way to do it um, I, I don't expect the people who run Crest would be terribly happy with the idea of putting Crest on DLT but you know I mean who knows um, and so the share is something, and there's something to link to. With an NFT, a typical NFT, there's nothing there. That's the problem. Good evening, Professor, and, and thanks very much for your talk. I had a question that relates to the rule that you can't trace money through a mixture at common law. And specifically, I was wondering how that might um, applied to cryptocurrencies because I see some superficial similarities between cryptos and money. So on the one hand they're fungible, but you also mentioned that they're individuated with uh, a digital record. Well, yes, but I mean <laughs> that's really that's a really tricky question and one I haven't given much thought to. I should just have to say so I'd rather not say too much on the top of my head. But I think it's a very interesting idea that what you have got is. Um, when, you, when you've got a mixture, so many of these assets are held in pooled accounts by custodians. So you would have a mixture um, in the way you might have a mixture of shares in a pooled account with a custodian, or I suppose you could use as a, 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 um, as a, as a similar idea, a sort of mixed bank account. Um, however, they are individuated in the sense that the transaction 
record is, is, rec is recorded and it's individualized. And as I understand it, there are even, I don't know if it's actually happening or whether people just think it's happening, but there, there's a differentiation in price between Bitcoin or whatever that has a clearly um, um, clean transfer record and ones where there is some kind of, of, of problem with the transfer because it may be thought that it's been used for money laundering or whatever. So it may well be in the future that we have difference in price and so we can, they are not entirely fungible. Um, having said that, um, I think that um, a, a tracing through a mixture would be, if we think of them as individuated but fungible, then we might, we are going to still have to think of them, if they are fungible, as being uh, fungible in, in the market we're talking about. We've still got to think of them being like a mixed fund or at least a mixture of goods, you know, a mixture of grain or whatever, which is that you can be delivered anything out of the silo. You don't have to be delivered the same grain. So the individuation, if it's treated as fungible, is not going to stop that. Um, whether it would really, I mean, there are one or two other issues that might be used in tracing, the other two might be a problem for tracing as well. One of the problems with tracing, as I understand it, is, you know, you would say, well, if you've got a, 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 a you can't trace it through uh, um, a bank account where it's moved from one account to another because you have a new asset, and you've got that problem as well with digital assets in one sense, or you might have. Um, and I think the, the other problem would be, that um, while you could, you might be able to physically trace it, you may have the common law problem that once it just gets mixed with it, the identification for the purposes of tracing goes because unless and you're back onto something like the you know the lowest um, uh, intermediate balance or something like that. Because I don't know, I can see that I can see that there could be a lot of difficulties, but it is true that because you can actually find out exactly where this digital asset has been, you, that might be able to overcome problems with tracing through a mixed account. Sorry, I've been told to stop. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't want to express their appreciation. Can I just say that the reception is through that door upstairs. Um, but, Louise, thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. It demonstrates that you are the, the best in this subject. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.